Pleasant morning to everyone. Morning. It's a blessing for us to be here, amen. amen. God has been so good to us. He has kept us safe. We are alive. And that's enough reason to give him all the praise. Yes. The honor and the glory. Amen. amen. What is a special welcome to those of us who are here. And to our special guest, we say welcome to you. And uh, we do miss that beautiful instrumental, Olivia. On the violin, amen. And uh, none has taken your place. So let's just keep praying for the Lord, amen. I've entitled the message, The Man Who Could Not But Did. The Man Who Could Not But Did. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace on this bright and beautiful Sabbath morning. <coughs> to give you thanks, Lord, for being so good to us. As we meet in this wonderful setting, and as you're about to open your words, open our minds, and give us understanding, we ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. Give me clarity of speech. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your message will be so clear and simple that it will be understood by, by all of us. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Let your message riveted into every fiber of our lives, made elicit from us a response, and made our sanctified effect on our characters. Lord, may we be fitted for your soon coming kingdom. These mercies we do ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And uh, verse 11, he tells us that we are pilgrims, and we are strangers here. This world does not belong to us. The meek will inherit the earth, that is the earth made new, amen? amen. But in the meantime, we are pilgrims and we are strangers. But because we are a chosen generation, it's those who have embraced the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Amen. Amen. Those of us are called the chosen. I'm not speaking particularly about the Adventist church, but those who have embraced the truth of God. Amen. Amen. Because in the kingdom there will be individuals from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, Amen. from every tribe, mm -hmm. sitting at that great welcome table. Amen. Amen. Because you, are, you and I are a chosen generation that makes us ambassadors for Christ. Yes. So we are ambassadors plenty potential. <laughs> now don't look for that in the dictionary, you will not find it. We are ambassadors plenty potential that gives us plenty potential. Because Christ is our King, He is our leader, Amen. Yes. And we are not to be afraid what the devil comes with because he is defeated for. He still a mighty conqueror, amen. amen. As the scripture reading was read, three of the greatest men that has ever walked upon the face of this earth. And their greatness is directly related to their service and their maker to the God of heaven, Jehovah himself, the great provider. Great men. And greatness is really not so much in the eyes of the world, but greatness is in the eyes of God. Abraham. Before he was known as Abraham, he was called Abraham, father of a household. He lived in 
Mesopotamia. His father's name was Tirad, and he was an idol worshiper. He would make idols and sell. So God called Abraham out of idolatry, out of paganism. God said, you shall no longer be called Abraham, but Abraham. Not father of a household, but father of a great multitude. And all that Abraham became and all that he possessed was a direct blessing from God. Amen? Amen. And his greatness was known, he was known as the father of faith. Father of the faithful. And from Abraham sprang the three great monotheistic religions of the world. Abraham, from Abraham, the Jews, the Muslims, and Christians all claim Abraham as their father. Almost half of the world's population, direct descendants of Abraham have been affected by his teachings. The Muslim claim that Ishmael was the firstborn. And my Bible tells me that when God said to Abraham, take your son, he said, take thy son, thy only son. Amen? Yes. Isaac. But God also bless Ishmael, what do you say? Yeah. All of us belongs to God. He's not a a partial God, amen? Mm -hmm. He's not an Indian giver. <laughs> he loves every single one of us, for God so loved the world. That includes every individual upon the face of this earth. That he gave the greatest gift. Next we look at the Apostle Paul. He, he who had been dedicated by Gamaliel. And the Jews held that Gamaliel was the greatest scholar who ever lived. And Paul sat at his feet. He was a highly educated Pharisee. And the Pharisees, in the Torah was lost, the first five books of Moses, but if it was lost, they could put it all back together by memory, word for word. They had memorized the books. Amen? And Paul was a highly educated Pharisee. And he thought that he was doing the will of God, but he had a misconstrued understanding of who God really is. Until uh, God had to knock him off his horse one day on the Damascus Road. See, whenever you're on the battlefield, and you get knocked off your horse, it means that you have been conquered. So Christ conquered Paul. So, before he was known as Paul, amen? amen. Christ conquered him. He had an amazing transformation. And uh, he, he concluded, I want to know nothing else but save Christ and him crucified. And he wrote 14 books of the New Testament. He wrote while he was in prison. He was in a Lamantine prison not far from Rome. And the prisons back then were not like the prisons we have today. The prisons today is like a country club, and I can tell you about it because I spent over 20 years as a volunteer in the prison ministry. The prisons back then were on the ground. It was a subterranean cell. All you had to do was lift a cover and they would drop you in there. The only time you saw the light of day is when they brought you something to eat. And he said, I greet the folks or the saints in Caesar's palace. Now, how did the saints get into Caesar's palace? Because whenever they came to visit Paul, he had something to say to them. Amen? Yes. And he said, I am sitting with Christ in heavenly places. And that was the heaven where Paul was in. All he heard was the screeching of rats, the cursing of inmates, and he had to stay in his own stench. Can you imagine the filth? And he was bound in his hands and feet. 
I could imagine on every scroll as he was writing, there was blood. And he said, I am sitting with Christ in heavenly places. Because Christ got together down there with Paul. Amen? Amen. The difference is not in the cage. The difference is the bird in the cage. Amen? Amen. He put a canary and a woodpecker in the same cage. And the woodpecker will spend his entire life pecking away the dead wood. But the canary will spend his entire leisure singing to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. The difference is in the bird. That's why the Bible tells us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. The great Apostle Paul, and some of the greatest theologians living today are still trying to wrestle with the, with the concepts that Paul wrote down in those short epistles. Amen. Even Brother Peter said some of the things that Paul wrote down are hard to understand. Yes. And he has shaped the entire Western world and the tenets of Christianity have reached to the far flung reaches uh, of the nations. And still have not been plummeted by the greatest man. I know the Jews believe that Gamaliel was the greatest scholar, but Paul wrote on the inspiration of God. Amen? Amen. And then we look at Moses. We're going to spend a few minutes on him. The great historian. Historians generally apply this title to Herodotus, the great Greek scholar who wrote 500 years before Christ. But before he wrote, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. A thousand years before he wrote. And the first book, the book of Job, it is believed that Moses wrote. And he wrote while he was a shepherd. Not while he was in uh, Egypt. But he wrote, he wrote while he was a shepherd in media. But he was no ordinary shepherd. He was a highly educated shepherd, amen? Nice. He wrote the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And one of the finest literary masterpieces of all time, recognized and regarded as the finest piece of literature ever written, the book of Job. He had a well-developed intellect, and probably no other document, and we studied about it this morning in the Sabbath school, the moral law, the decalogue, the law of liberty, the Ten Commandments, have reached the far-flung reaches of the nations, around the world, even in pagan cultures. You cannot travel into any part of the world and you will not find tenets or traces of this precept as the basis of divine worship and human relationship has affected the entire Western world. The three great religions of the world today. There is a statue of the Huguenots that's in a church in England and in Paris, and as, at its base it reads, He endured a seeing whom was invisible. Speaking about Moses, He endured a seeing him who was invisible, being in the very presence of the Almighty God. Upon the Mount Sinai, and when he came down, the Israelites could not even look on him. Being in the presence of God, his face shone like the noon of the sun. And he had to veil his face so they can look on him. Moses, the meekest man who ever lived. When we talk about greatness and their relationship to God, Abraham, the father of the faithful. 
Paul, the great theologian, and Moses, the great historian. Is very, is number one, is, that was prominent in his mind. The dream of his life was denied. What was this? What was the night? The, the thing that he lived for. <laughs> Let's piggyback on his boat. The command was to kill all the, the Hebrew males because when Joseph went down to Egypt, he was well favored by the Pharaoh. Because there was a series of events that took place and he ended up in Egypt. And not long after he was in a very prominent position. By a sequence of events, interpretation of dreams, and he was well favored. And uh, he was a wise individual because God gave him wisdom because he was faithful to the God of heaven. Amen? He brought his entire, entire family down there, and they were given a parcel of land in Goshen. And there they began to multiply and they increased in number and then started. And there was a new pharaoh that came along who did not know Joseph, but he had promised before he had died that he will will be here for a long time. But the day is coming when God will bring us out with a mighty heart. Amen? Amen. God will send the deliverer. Sin will not continue forever. Amen. God will interrupt the devil's plans, what do you say? And alter his plans. He will bring it to an end. Our God will have his way. You know the story of Jacob Ed, Miriam, his sister, when he was born, the midwife, knew that he was a Hebrew child, but he kept him alive. And Jacob had hid him for three months. But as little children, you cannot keep them quiet when you say amen. <laughs> they let you know that they are, they are around, amen. And, uh, she was very genius. She decided to make a basket. And she overlaid it with pitch inside and out. And she, she placed that precious gem in that basket and she set it a sail on the Nile. Can you imagine? He's going to die anyway. But she believes somewhere, somehow, that their God will intervene. And when the, when the daughter of Pharaoh, Hapships up, came down to wash herself in the river with her maidens, and she saw the basket. She told her servants, get me that basket. And when she opened the lid, she saw that it was a Hebrew child. And because she was childless, or she didn't have any of her own, she took the bed, and, uh, and Miriam was looking, amen? We got to look out for each other, what do you say? Yes. She was looking, I, I just could picture it in my mind. She was looking, and uh, she approached Hapshub's up, and she said, do you want a, a nurse for the bed? And I could imagine those 12 years he was given back. Those 12 precious years. Jacob had knew that the day will come when she will have to give him up. Moses means begotten of the water. Begotten of the water. That's what his name meant. The dead old Pharaoh was topmost and amnus. A good Pharaoh. Amen. The rule. And when he was 
given back to Pharaoh's daughter. He was educated in the best university in the most powerful nation back then, Egypt. He was trained in the arts and in culture and language and philosophy and history. He was trained in the military might, the great military might, unmatched by any other. He was trained to be the next fear of Egypt. And I want to remind us that the, the fear of Egypt is not only military might, not a well-developed intellect, but the fear of Egypt was also the priest of the pagan culture. And when Moses was asked to be the priest of the pagan culture, the Bible says, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God Amen. than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had a distorted picture of who God really was. He knew that his birth was special because it was embedded in his memory that you belong to the God of heaven. You are a Hebrew of the Hebrews, amen? amen? You had a miraculous transformation. You had a miraculous birth and, and you survived even though there was a death decree. Mm -hmm. So he knew that he was special. Yes. And one day he saw an Egyptian and a Hebrew having a quarrel and they were going at it. And uh, the Egyptian was uh, having the upper hand and he decided to intervene in his own way. See, we try to solve problems in our way. And he, he killed the Egyptian and he hit him in the side. You see, the, the, the thing was known that Moses thought it was a secret. He thought that he had gotten away with the crime. And he knew that the, the, the punishment would be lethal. Next day he saw two, Egypt, two, two Hebrews fighting, having a quarrel with each other. And they said to him, are you going to do the same as you did the day before? And then he realized that the thing was known and he decided to, to run for his life. When trouble comes, sometimes that's the best thing to do, amen? <laughs> You know, you know, uh, David was anointed to the business king of Israel. And yet he ran for his life because Saul was trying to kill him. Even though he said, you are the Lord's anointed, he was on the run. Amen? There are some folks you don't, know, you don't want to be around. What do you say? We need to choose our friends, even in the church. Moses, the great historian, the great man. His greatness was related to his relationship and his service to the God of heaven. I want to remind us that God is a loving Heavenly Father, what do you say? Amen. That call, God called him while being a shepherd of Midian. And God said to him, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh that he need to let my people go. Go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he began to make excuses and he said, I can't speak. How many times the Lord calls us and we make the same excuses? Amen? Amen. But when God calls us, He installs us. Amen? Amen. Yes. When God calls us, He equips us. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we shall show for the praises of Him who had called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Christ is the light of the world, amen? amen? The light is the truth because he said the truth shall make you free. We are free 
Indeed, amen. The greatest kind of slavery is not a physical slavery, even though that is bad enough. You are deprived of your rights and your privileges, and you are bound, and you are under rules and regulations. That's not the greatest enslavement. The greatest enslavement is an enslavement of the mind. When your identity is taken away, when you are taught that you are not what you are, and Christ came to liberate us from this slavery, Amen. the slavery of sin, because John said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world. What was the sin? The sin that is God was unjust. We had a misconception of who God is. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. God is a loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Something that, that Jesus is a compassionate God. And God the Father is a, is a stern, cruel God, willing to punish us. But because of Jesus, He shields us because of God. But I want us to know that Jesus came to reveal who the Father is. Amen. God is love. Whatever Jesus did and whatever he taught was an expression of who God is. Amen. God loves us. And Jesus paints a beautiful picture of who God is. God is love. And when God called Moses and said, go out to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go, God can always make up for excuses. Amen. He said, I'll make error on the mouthpiece, what do you say? But you will carry the rod, amen? Yes. I'll make error on your mouthpiece. And during a series of plagues, series of events, they got the message. You see, being, in, being enslaved, what is paramount? What is number one? What is priority that they needed to see? And the God of heaven. It's not so much that he's a God of love, but they needed to see a God of power. A God who is more powerful than the gods of Egypt. A God who is mighty, that there is none like him. And that's why God sent a series of events, knowing that the God of Moses is more powerful than the God of Egypt. That is what they needed to see. I'm going to remind us that we serve a mighty God, amen? amen. Uh, our God have, he don't have a problem of exposing himself, amen? How does a person's heart become hard? You see, when truth comes and we neglect truth, our, our hearts become hardened. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. His heart was not as hard as it was before the plagues, but because he did not, because he neglected, because he did not yield, because he did not surrender to Moses' his God, his heart became very hard. Our hearts become hard when we neglect truth. Amen. The truth sets us free. Yes. Amen. Some of the men who are born in prison, you can see the smile on their faces and the joy they have. There's a pep in their step. They enjoy the heart. They root them in their bones, amen. Because they have been free from enslavement to sin. Amen. There are some folks who are walking around. We are more enslaved than the people behind bars who are incarcerated. Amen. But if the son had said you're free, you're free, need freedom is in Christ, amen. I know what it's like being enslaved to pagan idolatry. I grew up in idolatry, paganism. And in Hinduism, they are literally thousands of gods. The COVID-19 is so rampant in India right now that the Indians in India, they are getting rid of all the idols. Literally, they are getting rid of them. They're just dumping them, and there are thousands of them. 
because they, real, they have realized that the idols cannot save them. Because they have eyes that they cannot see. They have ears that they cannot, they cannot hear. They have feet they can look. You've got to carry your God with you.